Welcome to the Potter Blog site. You inhaled 75 million atoms of plutonium 239. If you lived in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area in uh, four days in March 2011. Now, uh, the reason I developed this chart and the reason I'm discussing it again now is because there's been some controversy about hot particles and what the risk factors are and what the risk factors aren't. This is a chart I created uh, back in uh, March, or actually in April, to uh, figure out what my risk would have been in uh, San Francisco using uh, EPA's RADnet data on how much uh, plutonium atom was, atoms were detected in the air. Uh, specifically, if we look down here, we'll see plutonium-239. And the value listed is given in uh, picocuries per uh, meter cubed. And basically what we do to that, people don't really understand what picocuries per meter cubed is. So what we wanted to change that into is uh, how many atoms of plutonium is that floating around in the air. So we did these calculations here, conversion factors, specific activities, the atomic weight, uh, number of moles, Avogadro's number, and what we came up with was there's a 2.6 times 10 to the fifth atoms per meter cubed. And uh, that's in the air. That was in the air in San Francisco according to the EPA from March 15th through March 18th of 2011. In every cubic meter of air there were 2.6 times 10 to the fifth plutonium-239 atoms. And what I did was take uh, the breathing constant rate which is the number of cubic meters uh, per day that a person breathes, which is 72. And I figured out from that period how many atoms a person inhaled into their lungs that day of plutonium atoms. And what you can see here, it's approximately 75 million atoms inhaled on average by every person in the San Francisco Bay Area. Let's talk a little bit more about what this potentially means. Now we did another calculation here to figure out what the uh, the risk of uh, developing cancer out of this was. And we can't say for sure what that risk is. But again, we can express it into in terms of uh, how many people had a plutonium-239 atom give off an alpha particle while that plutonium-239 atom was in their lungs. Now the assumption was is that every plutonium atom inhaled was also exhaled. So nothing got stuck in anybody's lungs. And these plutonium atoms were in people's lungs for no longer than one second. Basically the inhale and the exhale cycle. So again, we took uh, RADnet's uh, value of how many uh, picocuries per meter cubed they detected of plutonium-239 in the air filter they had. Uh, used individual breathing rates, uh, determined the picocuries inhalation rate, changed uh, picocuries to uh, disintegrations per hour, sorry, disintegrations, uh, alpha disintegrations per second per picocurie. Uh, basically that means how often a, uh, a plutonium-239 atom gives off an alpha particle. And we took the uh, entire popula population per day alpha exposure. So every day there were 120.5 people on average who during a one second interval inhaled a number of plutonium atoms, one of which gave off an alpha particle into their lungs. Again, we didn't just think about the toxicity of the plutonium, we didn't think about the uh, plutonium staying in their lungs. We just said, out of all the people in, Calif in San Francisco, over that four-day period, 482 people had a uh, plutonium, atom, plutonium atom basically give off an alpha particle in their lungs. Now, if you believe some people, that would mean 482 people uh, were determined to get, uh, predetermined based on this, to get cancer, in, uh, lung cancer in California. We can't say with that with uh, certainty. But uh, I'm going to go and show you the chart and show you that plutonium wasn't the only thing in the air in California on that day. 
uh, one of the more troubling things. Well, let's show you what was associated with uh, with the plutonium-239. Here's the detection of plutonium-239. Uh, here are the sample dates. It was an air sample, air filtration, San Francisco, California. This data was all downloaded directly from EPA RADnet. So they sampled from 315 to 318 and uh, they did the analysis here on 324. And if you look here, that's the sample analysis date, if you read here. And this is how many picocuries per meter cube they detected of uh, plutonium-238. I'm sorry, plutonium-239. Now, if you look above it, you'll see they also had a detection of plutonium-238, but it's a negative number. Now, the reason that number is negative, what they do is, is when they have the detection, they say, well, let's subtract off how much we think is a false detection. So, apparently, they had a detection of plutonium-238, but it was less than their false detection value. So when they, it's like saying, oh, we detected 50 units of plutonium-238, but we would expect to detect 100, even if nothing's there, therefore we detected negative 50. But let's see what it was in the air with this plutonium-239 on this date. Uh, there was a bunch of uranium. Now what's interesting is the uranium-234 and uh, uranium-238 are part of the decay chain of the uh, plutonium-238, which was potentially detected. But uh, let's go here into the uh, gamma spectrometry. This was taken from 315 to 318, and the uh, samples were analyzed on 319. Again, this is air filters. The most disturbing one here is iodine-133. Iodine-133 has a half-life of 20.8 hours. And if we see here, we can see they detected a quantity of it. And this is a very solid detection. Now, this is a very short half-life, iodine-133, 20.8 hours. By the time they did this, uh, did this analysis, there was, there's already been a possibility of five half-lives of this thing decaying since they started the detection on 315 and they did the analysis on 319. So the whole time while they're doing this and waiting to do the analysis, it's decaying away. Now the important thing is iodine-133 changes into xenon-133. Xenon-133 is a noble gas. It, is the, it has been claimed to be the number one produced item of a, of a nuclear fallout at Fukushima. That the world was just bathed in xenon-133 because of Fukushima. What they don't mention is that a large percentage of it was iodine-133 before it became xenon-133. So for a 20-hour half-life iodine-133 to show up in San Francisco approximately 15 days after uh, the explosion in Fukushima or the event in Fukushima that means there was a significant quantity of iodine-133 created and it potentially means there was a good quantity of people in San Francisco who sucked up a lot of iodine 133 into their thyroids. Now if we look at the uh, gross beta detections here for the same period, and one thing we did here is uh, we kept these all to the same project number. So all these detections are from the exact same project number from uh, Fukushima, sorry from San Francisco, and it's project 1822. So every detection we have listed here is from Project 1822. Now if you see here, we have some pre-Fukushima samples, where the sample was taken from 223 to 33. Then we have a post, -initial post initial explosion. So we're getting them here, and so we can get down to right from here to here, 315 to 318. Um, that was a time period of the plutonium detections and of the other detections of iodine-133. Now if we look here prior to Fukushima, you can see the uh, amount of gross beta in the air filters is uh, 0 
So we're still before it reached uh, San Francisco, we're 0 0.002. And then right up to the point where we're getting close to this plutonium detection, still 0 0.002. Then we reach the time period that was common to the uh, plutonium detection, uh, the gross beta in the air jumps by 20 fold to 0 0.047. And it continues to hold that way from uh, 318 to 321, 0 0.046. So there was a large step function increase of 20 times background radiation just in beta. Now they also did field beta tests. And you say here, same project number. They call this uh, field radiation screening. Field radiation screening. So what I assume they did is they went out with detectors and uh, did detections out in the field. And if you go look here, again we have pre-Fukushima dates. And once again, when you look here to the uh, uh, date common to the detection, 318 to 321, we have uh, a massive jump in detections again from 0.003 to 0.048. Now if you look at this, there's a little bit of overlap here. Uh, this one ended on 315. This one started on uh, 318. So we knew, we know for sure something was happening on 318. Can't say for sure anything based on this data was happening on 315 between 315 and 318. So there's a lot of evidence, a lot of associated things going on with this plutonium 239 detection, all of which uh, basically have the fingerprint of Fukushima on them and show that San Francisco got hit with a, uh, a uh, basically a radioactive fog that came through. Now, when we go to the uh, gross beta detections, again, we mentioned the, sorry, not gross beta, but the gamma spectrometry detections. Again, we mentioned iodine-133 with a short half-life of 20.8 hours, which changes into xenon-133, which has a half-life of uh, five days. You won't see xenon on this list anywhere. And the reason is it's a noble gas and these detections were on air filters. They weren't from carbon air filters. You might detect some xenon in carbon air filters, but uh, from a regular paper air filter you're unlikely to because again it's a gas. So this presence of, presence of iodine-133 is a very strongly indicative of uh, a, a large amount of xenon we believe, xenon-133 in the San Francisco Bay Area at that time. And you can also see there's associated detections of iodine-131, uh, iodine-132, which is a very short half-life, two hours, but uh, it is the daughter product of uh, Tellurium, which has a, a three-day half-life. So a lot of iodine products coming through, but the one you won't hear mentioned very often is iodine-133. We actually suspect we had an iodine-133 detection here in uh, St. Louis based on uh, an initial half-life of roughly 20 hours and then a secondary decay product with a half-life of about five hours but there's still some uncertainty in that. But the key thing here is, and we'll go back to this chart, the way we try to explain this is in a way that people understand not just pictures of radiographs and not just discussions of hot particles but physically if you lived in California and San Francisco over this four-day time period, how many atoms of plutonium you inhaled and how many of those went off in your lungs? Now, if you figure that these things got stuck in your lungs, then the situation's a lot worse because then you have the uh, chemical toxicity problems of uh, plutonium in there too. But, uh, you know, when people try to tell you things are safe based on low numbers, like, uh, oh, is, look how small the number of Pico Curies this is. It's point zero 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 six five Pico Curies per meter cubed. Nobody understands that off the top of their head, what that means. But when you explain that, that means there's 75 million atoms of plutonium that you inhaled over this four day time period, and that if none of them stuck in your lungs and you cycle them out with every breath that 482 people in the San Francisco Bay Area had uh, a plutonium uh, 239 atom basically shoot off inside their lung 
then you start to get an idea of what the risk is. Good night.